today is a day of actions for social and civil diplomacy. I believe that we can begin now. Once again, we welcome all the friends and comrades in the framework of the World Social Forum, today being organized in Nepal from the 15th to the 19th of this month. In the name of the Civil Diplomacy Center, the Cooperation of Congress Star, and the Genealogy Academy, we are organizing these webinars. Uh, now, my name is Norshan. I'm joining uh, as part of the Civil Diplomacy Center, and I will moderate this webinar. To begin with, after welcoming everyone just one more time, we can say that we're very happy that everyone has joined. In an active way, we can share our experiences with each other. As everyone knows, the World Social Forum is a platform where all people and groups on the surface of the earth who, against neoliberalism and capitalism, occupation, and the problems the world is facing are struggling. These groups can come together. And for us, we want to share the experience uh, with the experiences of the struggle in North and East Syria through this, through this webinar. In North and East Syria, an alternative world is being built, is the name of this uh, uh, webinar. I'd like to welcome our friends and to introduce our guests. The first guest with us is Perwin Youssef, a member of the PYD, uh, the Democratic Union Party, and at the same time a member of Congress Star, the women's group. Um, head of <laughs> has played an active role in the writing of the social contract of North and East Syria. Zozan Sima, member of the Genealogy Academy, is here with us today. The program of our seminar will look like this. First of all, we'll watch a short video about the Rojava revolution. Everyone can watch. It's been made in English. After that, our first speaker, Perwin Youssef, will give a 15-minute seminar. After that, time for questions and answers, maybe 20 minutes. So everyone can join the discussion, share their questions, share their comments. After that, Zuzan Sima will share uh, what she has prepared. And then once again, time for questions, answers and discussion. Finally, after that, we'll have some closing words. If everyone is ready, we will begin. <laughs> Now, we'll share the video. The Rojava revolution continues to inspire millions of people around the world. It confirmed that building an alternative model to nation-state systems, capitalism, and patriarchy has become possible. Initially, the Rojava revolution was spread by young women fought alongside men against the brutal group ISIS defending their land and the values of humanity voluntarily and without hesitation. But now people all around the world know that this revolution has many aspects to see the democratic autonomous administration, which is based on the foundations and values of the democratic nation, ecological awareness, women's freedom and freedoms of religion and belief has been a living reality for more than 10 years in North and East Syria. The society that organizes itself within communes, local councils, cooperatives, municipalities, free academies, 
without being subject to the monopoly and authority of a central state is being built in Rojava, north and east Syria. Kurds, Arabs, Syriacs, Assyrians, Armenians, Circassians, Chechens, Turkmen, Chaldeans, Yazidis all live together peacefully and build their system on the basis of respect for all nationalities, religions, and communities without excluding anyone. Women have a leading role in all areas of life, breaking patriarchal stereotypes and building a society in which women have their own autonomy and are decision makers. On the other hand, the struggle continues to achieve an ecological communal economy that rejects monopoly and capitalism. It is an effective model that represents the solution to the structural crises created by nation-state systems and causing the continuation of racist conflicts, civil wars, and the intervention of global hegemonic forces. This model is based on the values of direct democracy, the society is organizing itself from the bottom up. This revolution no longer belongs only to the peoples of the region, but has become a hope all advocates of freedom, democracy, and justice throughout the world. Despite all the aggressive attacks by the central regime and regional states' regimes amidst international silence, the people in Rojava, North and East Syria, continue to resist, and the global popular solidarity continues to increase day by day. video um, Now that we've watched the video, we hope that everyone is ready to begin with the seminar. First of all, we're very happy to welcome Perwin Youssef, member of the General Assembly of the People's Union Party, co-chair of the Canton of Kamishlo and member of the Committee for the Social Contract. Good morning. Thank you very much to everyone giving help and support. We wish everyone success. As the people of North and East Syria, the revolutionary people of Rojava, for these 12 years, We've made many friends in these 12 years, and so we send greetings to everyone. For all of those who uh, search for freedom, who want an, a democratic Middle East and a democratic world, who follow the system built up in Rojava, Kurdistan. We greet everyone. We thank everyone for being here. We want to share all the experiences that we have made in North and East Syria, both in resisting occupation and in building up an, a new alternative system. First of all, in West Kurdistan. West Kurdistan is an area where after, in 2011, people joined the uprising of the peoples that began in Tunis and spread across much of the world. Um, because we already had a strong and long-lasting people's organization, where we had been struggling for a long time, as the Kurdish people, with the leadership of the thought and philosophy of Abdullah Öcalan, we had been living in this area, organizing ourselves. Despite that the regime did not recognize our rights, didn't recognize our existence, didn't recognize our language, and so Organizing had had to be clandestine, in secret, as we built up everything, including our own self-defense. 
when the revolution rose up in the Middle East, we joined this uprising, saw the opportunity to build up our own system and to find and take the rights that had been lost from us, that had been taken from us. And so we can build up a system, not the system that had been built up in the name of the Kurdish people could be built up across the whole region, including all the different ethnic groups, all the different peoples. There is the Arabic nation, the Assyrian nation, the, all the different religions, Islam, Yazidi, Christian. And so in a multicultural and colorful way, we could build up this system. So this revolution is somewhere where all the different people could find their existence, could find their being. And so this revolution is a revolution of the people. Some say it was the, the Arabic revolution, the Arab Spring. We say it's the revelation of the people, of all the people together in a multicultural, multicolored way. After the revolution, we began to build up the neighborhood communes. Um, special groups were set up so which could go house to house. He said, we took part in the revolution that began in 2010. But first of all, we had been organizing from where we were sitting, where we were standing. We knew that we wanted to join the revolution from 2010 to 2012. The most important work was to organize the people so that the people of the region could come to know each other, those who were resisting occupation, so that the Kurdish people could not be used against the Arabic people, the Arabic people could not be used against the Assyrian people, so that people would know each other. For this, we built up the people's councils, the neighborhood assemblies, so that the people could have faith in themselves. For the system that had been going so long, the system had enforced that the people did not believe in themselves, that the people could not survive without the state, without the system. And so they gave this impression among the people that the people could not raise up their heads, could not live without them. With the thought and philosophy of Abdullah Öcalan and with the self-belief of the people, we were able to organize the people. We were able to give this belief, understand the, spread the knowledge of freedom and democracy. So we used to spread the slogan that the people want to destroy the system that system that has oppressed the people. We're going to break that system. After that, instead of that, we will build our own system upon democratic principles. We saw that there was a great attack on us because the system of oppression, whatever regime it is, whether it's Turkish, any system that does not want our alternative system to be built up, they will always attack the people in the resistance. And so we need the people needed to be able to defend themselves. And so we need to build up the committees of people's self-defense. In Kobani, for example, the army that they had before were not in service of defending the people. The forces, the army were turned against their own people in the hands of the forces of oppression, of systemic oppression. heavy weapons even we used against the people and so the people need to organize themselves they need to be able to resist and defend themselves and so we built up the different committees of ecology of health so that society can organize itself on the one hand we need to be able to defend ourselves on the other we need to organize ourselves and so we by 2014, we were ready to declare our autonomy 
with the three cantons of Jazeera, Afrin and Kobani, we declared that this was the people's system, the people's or autonomous organizing to create a moral and political society um, that could defend ecology, defend itself. We gave many um, seminars, many educations to come together with the people so that the society to become organized. A society that is organized, knows itself, understands itself, knows what the future is for it. And for this, we needed to have the committee of education, education of the people, for mothers, for children, for all the generations in all the different languages. We built up our uh, democratic academy until 2014, when we were ready to announce the autonomous administration, when the social contract, the collective uh, contract was shared between all the different civil organizations. We made our uh, commitment. The social, the first social contract was announced. And so the people were agreeing to the autonomous administration. We were able to make a big announcement and launch the administration. Um, in 2014, we already found ourselves face to face with a great danger, the threat of ISIS. Before it was, the system attacked us with the, with the regime, the government regime. After 2014, it was with the face of Daesh, of ISIS. So after this, we needed to defend ourselves. They wanted to destroy the autonomous administration system so that it would not succeed so that the consciousness of the people would be destroyed to annihilate the people. Our people had represented the system of the autonomous administration to say that we would be organized in the face of the threat from ISIS, that the huge danger, the huge threat from ISIS, which was not only on our area of North and East Syria, but also on the whole world. It was genocidal. It was a murderous attack, attack not only on people, but on ecology in the world itself, particularly in the multiple attacks on women and femicides. The destruction of the ISIS system began in Kobani with the historic battle of Kobani. As we passed into the destruction of the system of ISIS, we could announce that we had ref refused and rejected this mentality. We became a force that could overcome the force of ISIS. Um, this was something that made us better known across the world, that among the Syrian people, the system of autonomous administration, um, which was victorious, had to be fought with something with a lot of faith and was something that attracted a lot of faith and was given a lot of faith. We fought back against ISIS in Raqqa, where ISIS had very successfully spread their system um, and built up our own understanding, consciousness. With the social contract, we came together under agreement that we could organize ourselves under the autonomous administration in all seven cantons of North and East Syria under the paradigm of a democratic nation, following the thought and philosophy of Abdullah Öcalan, so that we could build up a brotherhood of the people, we could build up social connection with the own forces of self-organization, self-defense and self-determination. We announce a social contract of North and East Syria for all the contracts of North and East Syria instead of the system of ISIS, we would have uh, the system of the, the force of the people, a system driven by the energy of the people. 
so that um, the force, social organizing force can be gathered together in communes. Once we can self-organize in communes, we can solve our own problems so that we can defend ourselves and so that we can answer all the questions that are in front of society. And so the economy that we began to build up, the social economy, so that every area in every neighborhood and all the people can organize themselves in the commune system and thus organize our strength. Instead of the system of occupation, instead of people coming in and occupying society, we want society to organize itself. Any understanding of the autonomous administration, we want not one person to be left poor. Every person be ready with their own force, their own thought to join the project. Everyone together can share in the system and share in the benefits of the system as well as participating. At the same time, one section of the social contract was emphasizing that culture is something very important, that everyone can practice in their own culture. The basis of the civilization on this geography is that we everyone needs to have their own culture, their own language, their own colors. So it was very important on the side of art and culture so that we could progress our arts. Under the system, there was also destruction and the culture and art of the people itself was lost. And so we began to develop a culture where we could share together that could bring us closer to each other on the side of building consciousness in the society for a free life together. Hevjiana Azad writes for women, children, for men, for everyone, how we could bring this about in all our assemblies, where the communes come together, in the commune assemblies and meetings. I could say that the, we're looking for gender equality, that we create gender equality at every level of the communes for men and for women, and so that everyone is free and in control of their own life, whether it's men, women, Arab, Yazidi, Kurdish, everyone should be a free individual, able to defend themselves, able to defend their own culture. And for this, people um, need to participate in the commune system. Everything is coming through the commune system, what work we're doing, how we're organizing ourselves, how we discuss things, what's needed, what the, for example, health, what's needed on the side of health to produce a healthy society. Everything is discussed in the communes and everything is brought about in the assemblies and the institutions of the autonomous administration so that these Decisions which come from the people at the grassroots can be put into practice. That's the purpose of the institutions of the autonomous administration. All the centers are centers of the people, organizations of the people, for the people to organize themselves, bring about their... If the speech can come together within three minutes. And so now um, the autonomous administration has been 10 years in the running. We can see that its color and its shape has been enthusiastically joined and accepted. All of the different forms of social organization that had been destroyed have been brought back through the, through the commune. And what had been taken away from us, we have supplied where we had no fuel. The Communes are now able to act in service of the people, in service of themselves, provide these basic necessities. Um, organize how the water is working, the electricity, and so on. And that every person in their own place can take part of this. The Turkish state has tried to annihilate the water supply, annihilate the electricity supply. And our people have stood up against these attacks. 
can say that we can become an alternative and be in the service of the people. There are many examples of this that we don't have time to explore, but the will, the belief and the faith of the people can achieve anything, can be victorious in anything. We have resisted against slavery. So where the desire is strong enough to build up an alternative system, we can see that we have brought about the system of autonomous administration according to the will of the people. Thank you very much. Eval Perwin Yusuf, member of the General Council of the People's Democratic Union Party. Now for 20 minutes, we'll have discussion. We'll open the discussion. Everyone who wants to join, comment, or ask questions, either in the chat, or you can just speak up, ask to speak. We'll open the discussion around the Rojava revolution and the alternative built up in North and East Syria. Perhaps on the topic of the social contract, as Perun Yusuf brought up a bit, the autonomous administration, questions or discussions or points, opening it out to speak. There's a question in the chat. If Parwin can uh, <laughs> discuss a little bit more the process of the social contract, who wrote the initial drafts, on what basis and how were they edited, how was the social contract formed. Maybe we can say all the questions and after Eval Parwin can give an answer, or we can go one by one. So as we said in 2014, the first draft of the social contract was formed um, and was accepted. So as the initial initiative was the uh, initiative of Tevdem, with the participation of all the different sections of society. So the draft needed a lot of changing, a lot of editing, a lot of transformation, we said, okay, exactly what, what changes do we need to make? How can we come to organize ourselves? We brought together many, many opinions and made many consultations on this topic. Um, three years until 2016, there were many, many events of discussion, many, many consultations um, in the different regions, also with the different ethnic groups in Afrin and Kobani, these Kurdish majority areas, the initiative was started, but we could also bring in Arabic groups as a Syrian, we made a lot, a lot of meetings, discussed how, um, whether we wanted autonomy from Syria, whether we wanted to remain a part of Syria. In the end, the conversation came that we take our force from the force of the people and those who are self-organized. So there are important points uh, in democracy, in a free life together. We've arrived at agreements between some parties. And the end, by the time the social contract was first published, it was after many years of experience in these three cantons. And as a result, an opportunity that, that all three cantons since then, since 2016 until 2023, there have still been many meetings, much more discussion. What does it mean to have had 10 years of this revolution? What stage are we at? How do we want to adjust the social contract? What are the needs? What are the wants? In order to gather the opinions of all the peoples of all the different ethnic groups, and so the Committee for the Preparation of the Social Contract has passed to many different places, bringing, taking the opinion of the people in Kamishlo, in the Jazeera region, 
until the level of the whole of North and East Syria. Politicians from all the different ethnic groups have joined and taken part so that we can come to produce the second social contract of where any mistakes or weaknesses were in the original one from 2014. We have two other questions for Val Parveen. Um, one is, can we discuss how, if we can discuss how Urgeland's literature influences the autonomous project? The other question is, how do we handle and what's the situation with the women who joined ISIS? I can give an answer to these questions. So, as we said, the start, just as we were going around all these different areas, um, all of this was done in the paradigm of Abdullah Ujalan. Before we announced our independence, there was organizing and clandestine organizing, trying to raise consciousness, always in line with this, uh, with the thought and philosophy of Abdullah Ujalan. Um, it's a very broad perspective. Whenever we were holding meetings, it was always within this framework, whether even including in the prisons, um, asking what is the third way. Um, the third way is the way of the people. This became a great belief that we want democracy. Yes, but what does that mean? What does it mean? We want freedom, but what does freedom mean? We want equality, but what equality? Equality for who? And so we can turn to the thought of Abdullah Ujlan in particular, the manifesto, uh, fifth manifesto, how to build up the institutions in their own places. This was something completely new. We'd never seen this. For our whole lives, we'd been alienated and cut from our own decisions, from our own power. We'd always just been under the power of the system. And so how we could, with the force of the people, come together and organize, we needed to learn to make a system in which the different ethnic groups could all work together, a multi-ethnic society. So this, in the thought of Abdullah Ujalan, a plural nation, was something that was very new for us. We'd seen a lot of war, a lot of displacement, a lot of refugees. Whichever ethnic group you were, Kurdish, Assyrian, Arabic, Chechnyan, we were suffering these things. And so we needed to build up a plural nation. We needed to build, every group needed to build up their own organization. This was something very fundamental from the philosophy. For the other question about the women who joined ISIS, uh, the camp specifically where women who became part of ISIS are held. They, within that camp, there is an education system. We're sometimes going there, holding discussions, attempting to change the consciousness. It's something very, very difficult. There is a really strong belief in them that once again, they want to build up the Islamic State. In order to break this consciousness, we're giving every effort that we can to change this perspective, change this mentality, and bring them a perspective from the truth. There are a lot of seminars, a lot of meetings, a lot of events, but there is still a danger, there is still a risk, because they are really a force who can make attacks. And there is still the force of ISIS amongst us. And so it's something that actually everyone internationally and across the world needs to come together to help with. There needs to be a huge effort. It's a huge work to change this consciousness and to overcome this perspective and consciousness of ISIS. And there needs to be international cooperation to get there in order for that change and transformation to really happen.
it cannot just be us. It cannot just be the autonomous administration or the people of northern East Syria. It needs to be everyone across the world in order to change this perspective and mentality. I think we have another question. This will be the last question. After that, we'll come to the second part. How is the morale of the people and the movement following the recent attacks of the Turkish state? This truly, this is a people in resistance, a people who give resistance. This resistance gets bigger with every attack, whether it's ISIS or the Turkish state, whether it's the Ba'ath regime. The people live in their with their own resistance. With their in the memory of their martyrs. In the future, we need to fight with this faith and this belief. Our morale is still high, is still strong. Just now, the anniversary passed of the imprisonment of Abdullah Ujalan, who's this is fundamentally connected to the line of our freedom. This is something we're always struggling for because our freedom and our organization is so fundamentally connected to this philosophy, to his philosophy. And so with a real strong faith, a strong will, we need to also fight for his freedom and become and remain a free people. Okay, thank you. So if we have no more questions, friends can also join in the second section. Now we welcome Haval Zozan Sima, member of the Genealogy Academy. Also, worker taking her place in the Rajab revolution, struggling for women's freedom in society. The Genealogy Academy makes a lot of research within the revolution and among the people. Now, and the topic of women's leadership, particularly in the world of science and knowledge. If you're ready, please begin. A very warm greeting to everyone. And thank you very much for this opportunity so that we can advance this work. I want to start on some general points. We can see that across the world today, there is an uprising of women. There is a great surge of women's struggle. There are also a lot of discussions, a lot of theory, a lot of different organizations. The experience of the free women of Kurdistan, we have a history of a long struggle against patriarchy. In general, what results do we get from this struggle? What have we got out of this struggle? Women who have been struggling for hundreds of years, where are the experiences and the results of this struggle? On the one hand, this is a local question. On the other hand, it's always a universal one. Because if a struggle in one region gets a result, this can become an opportunity for people across the world, a new method. The story of women's slavery is something old and historical. And so the methods of resisting this need to be of the rooted in society and deep and well developed. If we're going to destroy the system that has oppressed women this far. We can say that we are living under capitalist modernity and that liberalism within this has, has liberalized the question of women's freedom and the women's freedom struggle. On the one hand, we resist against conservative patriarchy. On the other hand, we now face the new attacks of liberalism. which puts even greater obstacles in the way of our struggle. 
because many things are hidden and not visible um, and things are stolen from our struggle. Women have given a huge and valuable struggle for many years, but everything has been connected to legal rights or economy and the system of liberalism now uses women's struggle for its own purposes through NGOs, de-radicalizes the movements. So for us, it's an important topic of criticism and self-criticism for women's movements across the world, how we can find a new way. For the free women's movement of Kurdistan, we have an experience of 40 years because we are people oppressed and an oppressed class within the movement. We can say that we are three or four times colonized. Rebrapo Abdul has been in the Imrali prison for 25 years in isolation. His thoughts and philosophy have, uh, in the name of his thoughts and philosophy, a, women, a new women's system has been built up, starting in all four parts of Kurdistan and spreading across the world. In this struggle, the most significant thing as we can see that the revolution in northern Syria, revolutions in the Middle East need to be revolutions of the women, a women's revolution. So that we do not fall into the mistakes of previous struggles. Um, our struggle needs to be led by with women's freedom, with women's struggle. So we can say that now in North East Syria for the last 10 years, but we need to remember that for the last 40 years, this struggle has been going on in all four parts of Kurdistan and outside of it as well. Now we say that the revolution is of North East Syria, but it's a long struggle, a long and wide struggle. Um, in North East Syria, where you've seen the revolution, we can call this a women's revolution. As Haval Parveen was describing, very, uh, before the revolution, everything was clandestinely organized. And as is known now, the attacks are coming from all sides, from all the different nation states, outside and inside. Um, patriarchal uh, occupying nation states um, at the same time the American forces and the neoliberal threat comes from there as well as someone was asking if you If you want to organize a commune, if you want to go to education, whatever it is, we are constantly under threat of attack currently from the Turkish state. People risk being killed going about their work and trying to organize, but nonetheless, they are doing it. Nonetheless, they are coming together. Um, I want to speak a little bit about how we take our place as the Genealogy Academy in the Women's Revolution. To begin with, it was important for women to just to, to claim their human rights, political rights, as an oppressed class, as the oppressed peoples, as a geography that had been oppressed. Women were always taking their place in all these different aspects of the struggle. So in previous struggles, um, the class or nation state, women played their role. And now in the 21st century, we can see that the women's struggle is taking center stage. To begin with, women were joining the struggle um, as a national struggle. 
But in the 1990s, something changed. We also took on the goals of women's rights for to make the Kurdistan revolution a women's a women's struggle and a women's revolution. The field of defense became something really important. Autonomous organization came up first in a situation of war, the need for self-defense. Then there was also civil society organizations, political parties, also with the autonomous women's framework. In the following years, this spread in all four parts of Kurdistan, in every area and field, everywhere that there was organization, there had to be autonomous women's organization. Whether it was even in music groups, in art and culture, we had to have autonomous women's organizing. Apart from that, in general, within society, there was a work of organizing women, bringing them together. In North and East Syria, after, in 2011, the opportunity arose that we could put these ideas into practice. so that we can organize ourselves more as the forces withdrew, the oppressive forces withdrew. And so women's organizing was spread even more in this region. Women took on roles in decision-making in the general organizing. This was something that was achieved at great cost and with great effort. In our region, there's still a really deep patriarchy. There's still different uh, forms of clan organizing with very conservative traditions. Um, the religious cultures have made a huge impact. And there was no, women did not have a lot of experience in organization. And so there were a huge amount of obstacles in their path. When we build up a autonomous system for women, It's, it's a huge struggle that needs to be advanced. Now we have the system, as Hevel Perrin mentioned, of equal representation. We have 50-50 um, uh, gender representation at every political level. Many times uh, across the world where you do not have this representation, um, decisions are taken that are not in the benefits of women. Of course, in many places, we have um, this idea of quotas of representation for women, but there's a contradiction here because quite often this still isn't actually representing women's interests as a class. We cannot just count it as quotas of numbers of representation um, of women as individuals in certain roles. Any woman who is uh, in a political role needs to have uh, women's organizations at her back, not just progressing your advantage as an individual or as a person, but to be connected to strong women's organizing. Every woman who takes her place in a role, there needs to be, for us, she's representing the assembly or the councils of women and those rescissions. If she's not representing the benefits of the organized women's movement, then the movement has the right to criticize that, to make an intervention. And so we're ensuring that women are, where women are represented, it's not just as individuals, but to represent women's interest as a group, as a class. We also see that not only if we're just individuals, not only are we not so able to represent women's collective interests, but we can very easily be assimilated or crushed by the system. At the same time, any meetings and any organizing that we have, there is always separate women's meetings beforehand, whether it's political, um, the women meet together beforehand, can take decisions together. 
So there are mechanisms so that women's decisions and opinions can be brought um, to light and made clear in the decision-making process. When women take their place in the works, there are mechanisms so that their decisions can be recognized and so that they can overcome the obstacles in front of them. Sometimes we think that if we give education about sexism, um, then and consciousness is raised, then women will be able to struggle freely. But struggle is more than just consciousness and awareness. It must be something that is organized. If it's not organized, it will come to nothing. That consciousness and that awareness gives us a heavy responsibility. Um, and if we are not an organized force, we will not get a result from struggle. And so we have a special system where many institutions, many organizations have been built up for women's political advancement. In the defense forces, the security forces, all the different institutions working together. So that, and in this, a genealogy also has a role. We're discussing different events, things that happen on the side of awareness and consciousness according to different events that have occurred, what education is needed, what problems there are with society for the women's movement, for women's assemblies, according to those, according to those questions, we're holding discussions, sociological, political, so that so when we see problems, we're not just moving to punishment or to response so that we can really get to the root of the matter and make social transformation at the base. One topic that is research by genealogy, a lot of education is given on something for equality and how we can overcome our obstacles. These we need to look at through uh, sociological research. The problems. So that the sociological research of genealogy can become a basis to advance women's struggle. So that women's struggle has a sociological basis to advance upon. It will not come about just by rights given in law. The women's revolution needs to give an answer to the questions that are in front of us. How can we overcome sexism? How can we overcome the patriarchal family? How can we overcome underage marriage? The oppression that has made such an impact on us. How can we remove, uh, defeat the domestic violence? So we cannot just say that the women's revolution has been achieved because a women's revolution needs to be a cultural revolution, not just a political or military one. Once again, I'll emphasize as Havel Perwin said that for a long time our society was living under a feudal values with a deep sense of patriarchy. Then the time of ISIS also made a huge impact on this society. And so the impact on the mentality, the relations between men and women, the needs for education, how people can join social organizing or political organizing, a lot of uh, transformation is needed. Since 2011, a lot of transformation has been made. 
a lot of advancements and steps have been taken towards equality, women's equality. And as the Genealogy Academy, we can analyze this, ask what the impacts has been, how we can make a positive transformation in our own colors, not copy and pasting from Europe or another place, but with our own force, in our own colors and in our own ways. We can bring this about with education as well. In short, I can say that the work of transforming consciousness is paramount. And so there are hundreds of academies across North and East Syria, and genealogy is some of these academies. How can we live a free and equal life together? Asking these questions, um, pushing against uh, sexism towards the democratization of the family. We give some educations just for men and some just for women so that people can discuss together and center on things that are more important. The questions that we're facing with the co-chair system in lived reality, we can also make into a subject of education. With the perspective of women's freedom, how can we bring about equality between men and women? In the first couple of years, the 2011-2012, there was uh, announced uh, an area connected to social education of genealogy, so that has now been going for many years, several years. Um, in levels of education in the school, um, also in some universities globally in different uh, feminist departments, there is a relationship with genealogy. We see in general that women's identity is a question, that there are many transformations in women's identity, many transformations in the relationship between men and women. However, there is still brutality, backwardness, sexism. We still have a lot of work in front of us. And so we still have an important role to play in transforming the consciousness of society. I could say this a bit about our role, our work of genealogy, what the science of women, what role the science of women plays. I thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Neval Zozan, Neval Zozan Sima, member of the Genealogy Academy. Very important, valuable things brought to light. Now we want to discuss if everyone has, if anyone has questions or also um, points they would like to bring. We want everyone to share their own experiences with us. You can write directly in the chat. Kurdish, English, or you can ask to speak and we can discuss a little if there are any questions. In general, we'll look at the question how this model, which is built up now in Rojava, as, as has been discussed, as already not just something restricted to one region, to one people, but has an impact on many societies, particularly societies and people who are facing social questions brought by capitalism. We know that capitalism makes a hugely negative impact on all societies across the world, and for this, the world social foreman has become a platform for societies to, and groups and people in struggle to come together. And so 
We want to have a discussion in this aspect. I think we have another 15 minutes remaining. Someone who says, how can I come and learn about what you're trying to achieve and your struggle and experience in Rojava? I can say to Lanonika, I think that's how you say your name. This, um, that you want to do this gives us a lot of morale. Um, we really want everyone to come as well. Um, it's an open door to any of those struggling and in resistance in the world. However, we face a, the, an isolation in general. There is the sanctions around Rojava. We want to solve these problems. Even now, there are hundreds of internationalists working in Rojava, taking part in the struggle in an active way. Uh, and so anyone who does want to come to this place, to, this, to our land, to see our work, we can give some help and support. We hope that the World Social Forum one day will be held in Rojava. This can be a goal for the future. There's another question. I saw that the University of Rojava has called out for support in science. Um, what can more what can more broadly be done uh, in academic departments to help the University of Rojava? on the side of uh, science, particularly genetic, if um, this is something that the academic circles are concerned with or not. Does anyone want to explore or answer this question? I can say some things on this topic. The University of Rojava has, of all the things that uh, we have worked hard and given a lot of effort to create through difficulties. The University of Rojava is one. It's a university that has a call out uh, for support from anyone who is struggling against capitalism. Um, there is always a need for help and support, for solidarity. Solidarity is something very meaningful, very valuable. We want to continue the work of the University of Rojava for helping the university is something for education, for helping to continue and build up uh, the revolution itself. Um, any support and solidarity from other institutions is something very great and we can make these connections. If you can put your email in the chat, we can be in touch to develop a process around connection with the University of Rojava. Here in the chat, TV John is saying, taking patriarchy headlong as the starting point and having built up to the present has been fabulous. Congratulations. We're learning from you. Congrats and thanks for the way. Thank you, TD John. If anyone wants to say their opinions um, specifically, how we can mobilize. How we can be in solidarity and support the Rojava model and spread it more widely, despite the experiment being in the Middle East, how it can spread across the world. There's the example in particular of the struggle against ISIS and of the social problems which are being solved here. If anyone has input or discussion on these topics, if anyone wants to share um, their opinions about the Rajab revolution also, we're very happy to hear. We'll wait a couple of minutes if people want to make comments, and if not, we'll move to close of the seminar. Joy Siraj joining here saying that global solidarity is very important. We believe that 
we also believe uh, a friend has joined from India. Uh, it's very um, something very beautiful that we can work together in the future. I think there are some comments, I can't read them all, but today is a day that's given us a lot of morale, a lot of motivation. Oh, sure. I mean, if you can share in the chat the PDF, there's a lot of extra reading, further reading for people to explore. That would be really good. For those who want to understand the Rajab revolution even better. If we can share that again. For those who want to come into a system with uh, Congress Star, the Civil Diplomacy Center, there's information there. <laughs> Obviously, we had uh, good presentations here, as there aren't too many questions. And so, to finish our program, First of all, I'll give the word to Haval Parween, just for maybe three minutes um, closing statement. Thank you for everybody's time. <laughs> it's really difficult to express the 10 years of revolution in a few minutes. Um, we can't just in a few minutes explain However, I can say that this is a revolution that has come through incredibly difficult times, but has given rights to everybody, to all the peoples, upheld those sacred principles. Now we see a problem before us. How can we destroy the system of oppression? All the people together. How can we move to a time of peace and democracy across the world? We see in the system of oppression that we live under, uh, we need to understand that the autonomous administration is something that has been created by the people and not just, and a huge effort, not just those in from North and East Syria, also our internationalist friends, so that we can, with success, overcome all the obstacles before us. We want to thank for all the effort from our friends, for our comrades, to destroy the threats in front of us, resist the attacks of ISIS, resist the attacks of the Turkish state, destroy this system of occupation and oppression, so that instead we build the mentality, consciousness of the unity of the people. We have a great hope, a great hope that people across the world want an alternative system. want to destroy the system of oppression. And we hope that the that the voice from the Rajav revolution can reach all corners of the world so that we can be a support, we can support each other wherever we are, whether it's struggle, culture, knowledge, so that we can build up a comradeship between us and move towards a free and democratic life. With this belief, with this faith, those who are seeking freedom, we take a lot of motivation. Also from the questions, from the interventions of the people here, for those across the world, 
are in this struggle and we wish everyone freedom and success. There's one question before we give the closing words to Havaz Ozanan. What's our relationship with uh, people in the different areas of Kurdistan? For the question, I can say um, that uh, the advancements made in Rojava have been followed already with great interest by the youth and all the people of North, East and South Kurdistan. And so there's a very important connection Many uh, politicians or organizers from other parts of Kurdistan. We have a relationship of solidarity and mutual aid. With the perspective of a democratic nation, there is also work and effort and in institutions in the other parts of Kurdistan. For example, um, educators from in the Kurdish language from North Kurdistan who started up in the refugee camp of Mahmur have then also arrived in Rojava. And so there is a huge solidarity between all four parts of Kurdistan. I apologize, it's cutting out. <laughs> and so because of the achievements in Rojava, we've also brought a lot of uh, uh, a lot of people from across the world, anarchists, feminists, um, socialists, not just in solidarity, but seeing that this is also their revolution, your revolution, and that we're working together for all our achievements. So that we can better share and offer all the achievements that we have. So that our voice can reach across the world. Um, as a final, we'll say Jinjian Azadi, Women, Life, Freedom. Thank you so much. Many very beautiful things have been shared today. I'll put the video that we shared at the start in the chat so that everyone can access it. It's also on the Civil Diplomacy Center YouTube channel if you want to watch it again. The PDF has also been shared from the Genealogy Academy with much further reading. Lots of different information. And to finish, we thank all the participants very, very much. And to the World Social Forum. Maybe we're not in Nepal today with the discussions. But we've come together again online. We thank uh, Perwin Yusuf and Zulzan Sima for sharing such important things about the Rojava revolution, social struggle, women's struggle, for all of our participants. We thank you very much with very open hearts, watching and joining and following and giving comments and word. With a special thanks to the technical group who have supported us, to the interpreters, Ronahi and Jennifer, we thank them as well for the effort. A very good work has been progressed today and we hope that we can deepen our discussions in the future. 
and with the uh, friends who have shared the emails, we'll start uh, in communication. This webinar was made in English and Kurdish was recorded, and so it's possible to uh, save it and send it and share it later. Very finally, I want to say that the Rojava revolution, the alternative world being built in North and East Syria, is also facing a huge threat. In order to defeat this threat, in order to struggle against capitalism, patriarchy, neoliberalism, and the forces that want to destroy this revolution, we need to build up a common struggle. We need to stand against these forces together and build up a social system of confederalism. We'll continue the struggle. We wish a great success for the people, the women, for society itself. We thank you very much for all your efforts and send many greetings to all the participants across the world from Rojava. Thank you so much. Many greetings. I'll share the video again and people can take their leave as they wish. Thank you so much.